Welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. My name is Dr. Liz Bobeck. I am an associate professor at Iowa State University. And today I have the honor to interview Dr. Drew Benson. He is an assistant professor at UGA. Um, he is doing both teaching and research. And welcome to the show, first of all. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. It's good to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to uh, finally get a chance to interview you. Um, you you're working in some areas that kind of are um, overlapping with what with m my group does. So I always love to hear people um, talking about like reproductive biology and whatnot. So uh, can you uh, first tell us how you got into poultry? So I, it was, it comes full circle. So I, I, I was originally wanted to be a, I took a trip as a kid. I wanted to be a, a, a park ranger in, at Yellowstone. That was, and, and like most college students who come into my class, like they're dead set on being a veterinarian or they're dead set on some career path. Mine was to work in the National Forest Service. Uh, came to find out, you know, that's a little tougher to get the assignment you want. I really didn't want to end up in an antebellum house in Southern Mississippi. Um, so I explored, which is what all students should do. And I took Introduction to Poultry Science. Fell in love with it. It was the perfect kind of combination of, you know, scientific pursuit and natural love of animals and just uh, 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 with a business a aspect and something you felt good about. Um, and, you know, the instructors there in the poultry science department were, it, it was a home away from home. I came from a small community. UGA was huge, immediately felt at home, fell in love with the subject and was lucky, blessed, however you want to phrase it, to come back and teach the same course that originally recruited me into it. So hopefully I'm able to pay this forward and, and inspire some other students in the same way I was inspired. Gosh, that, that's awesome that you, you're full circle teaching the course that kind of got you into poultry. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's what we have to do. Yeah, hopefully we can get more students in this classroom, you know, in, in poultry and and teach them because they don't really come in with any kind of, usually it's with a negative bias and, and they don't understand all the science that goes into producing an efficient animal protein and, and telling that story, you know, enthusiastically telling it and hopefully inspiring enthusiasm in them, um, I hope is just going to recruit more, um, you know, high impact individuals into the industry. Yeah. Um, so when, when you said you wanted to be a park ranger, I just thought of the hours <laughs> of my life that I watched Yogi Bear. Was that <laughs> one yeah, of your well, inspirations? It was, it was that. It was, going, it was going to Yellowstone, coming from the south, and just seeing a whole different landscape and going, oh my gosh, I have to get out here. Um, and that kept me going until I was introduced to chickens properly, and that was it. <laughs> chickens. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, so d does your uh, course have a lab component? Do you get to watch students interact with a bird for the first time? <laughs> That's our big selling point. In fact, this morning, um, we, we, we have a recruitment, and part of our sell is the fact that we are very hands-on. Um, so we have, I just got out of a meeting this morning about our open house event that we're going to have in November where we invite high school students all around the state to come and it's really to showcase all the opportunities we offer them in the lab. So, you know, I have 13 labs out of the 15 week semester where they are, and probably 10 of them, they are working hands on with animals. In the intro course, we do two grow out experiments that they're kind of in charge of. Um, and then we have the anatomy and physiology course to do where we actually get to look at real time, collect real time data from chickens under anesthesia. So that kind of recruits, you know, the veterinarian students into the, you know, opens them. And a lot of my students came in, not necessarily avian biology or poultry science, but are now in, you know, veterinary school with an anticipation of being a poultry veterinarian. So, um, but anyway, it's, it's too, really get that hands-on experience to show them this is what it's like to work with poultry. It's a hands-on aspect, right? I mean, you know it, you know, our research, we're not pipetting all the time. We're out there with the birds. We come in and we pipette, but you have those birds you have to take care of. We are very hands-on. And 
And to show them that and get them involved really sparks interest. Gosh, um, uh, you're high speed with two grow out experiments during that semester. We, my class does one and I just think, man, the students are, <laughs> they're overwhelmed the first time, but having two grow outs, they would know what they're doing for sure. <laughs> yeah. When they're done. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, that sounds like a class I want to be part of. So uh, do you uh, take auditors from other states? <laughs> yeah, that, that is my whole intention is to get as many as I can in there, right? Because to just to spark it, right? To spark that, yeah. oh, this is, is kind of cool, right? Yeah. And then follow it up with some more classes. Yeah. Gosh, that, that's such an inter interesting way to teach uh, introductory students with even putting birds under anesthesia and taking, uh, you know, different biological parameters that I can see how you would definitely pull in veterinary minded students. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. Um, you know, I, in Iowa State's probably in the same uh, kind of category is we, we get a lot of suburban students. Like, you know, if you go back 25, 30 years, we're, 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 we're I wouldn't say predominantly, but it was, it was a mixture of rural and suburban. And we don't get as many rural students as we used to. Um, and so we have to really, it, one, recruit them into the course with these opportunities, which are great, uh, but getting them recruited into this, then we can share, oh, look what this industry is about, because you've never seen it, you don't know anything about it. And so it, 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 opens, it, it opens up new avenues for them to explore. Yeah, I think, honestly, with teaching a similar intro poultry course, that is one of the biggest um, game changers for students, knowing that there are well-paying jobs across the United States available to them. Oh, yeah. And they graduate is a, is a big deal. And uh, one of my first labs is called the Touch a Chicken Lab. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> because some, yeah. some students have never picked up and handled a bird. So the first, the first lab is really low stress. It's like, pick this bird up and handle it. And that's See what hard. happens. I, I call it hug a chicken. Touch a hug, you just, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they quickly learn um, which way to point the rear end because. That's right. That's, <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah. That's an important aspect. <laughs> it's very important if you like the clothes you're wearing. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Well, I'm glad that you're, uh, you're excited to teach the intro students because, um, it's people who are teaching those first classes that really change who wants to enter the industry. That's right. And, and, and the industry needs it. We, we need, you know, a breadth of individuals and we're getting really good graduates out there. So, and, and I'm always happy to see as they progress after graduation. It's, a, it's kind of a, a position of pride, a position of joy. So Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so, so outside of your, um, your teaching uh, obligations for your appointment, can you tell me a little bit about what you're currently doing for research, maybe some of the more exciting things? <laughs> yeah, so in terms of research, so I have kind of, you know, applied and a basic approach to understanding and improving fertility with a particular approach on broiler breeders. Um, and, you know, just recently, it, this has come more or less to the forefront. The U.S. Poultry and Egg mm -hmm. Association just put out a grant specifically targeting this. And um, if I would say there's anything that can be improved with our broilers, it's their reproductive fitness. Um, we, their growth rate, their efficiency is outstanding. Um, reproduction could use some improvement. And, and on that, um, you know, we often use certain parameters aside from just fertility, such as sperm mobility or sperm hole penetrations around the germinal disc, right? So the germinal disc, that little white spot where fertility occurs, that's our measurements, you know, mo sperm mobility on the male side, uh, along with sperm hole penetrations combined male and female. The thing is we really don't understand the mechanisms behind those assessments, right? We don't have a full grasp of the proteins that are involved with sperm mobility. We don't have a full grasp of the proteins that are involved with that initial binding and why sperm tend to bind more around the germinal disc region, the non-germinal disc region. And so clearing up, right, that identifying those proteins and clearing up um, what's actually happening to initiate fertility 
would hopefully be a springboard to better understanding and lead to improvement ultimately with dwarf breeder fertility. So, you know, I've looked at um, the inner paravitellin layer, which is that layer that surrounds the ovulated ovum, and how the zona pellucida proteins, which make up that IPVL, how, you know, what is their relative abundance on the IPVL layer? I, good point is we do find significant differences. So um, we found that there is differences that exist among lines, and that's kind of a green light or an indication that they can be changed. It's not just a static, not all chickens are gonna have, all genetic lines are gonna have the same IPVL components. So it is subjected to change upon selection in our lines, which means we should have the capacity ourselves to change that. Now let's understand what they do and what they mean. Um, and so luckily we've been able to find one, in particular this interesting, our lab found that this protein ZPB2 is far more concentrated in the germinal disc region where the sperm are binding than a non-germinal disc region, indicating that it may be playing a role right in that initial binding um, or maybe initiation of the acrosome reaction to facilitate uh, fertilization. And so uh, we've looked at that, we follow that up with a, a few studies and confirm that, yeah, it's pretty consistent among birds that this germinal disc location is, or the ZPB2 is going to be more concentrated at this location. Um, interestingly, I like to deal with proteins. Now, proteins are extremely frustrating when it comes to birds. I get really jealous of our mammalian colleagues um, who can just go online and purchase an antibody and really follow through. Um, so we have done both mRNA and protein. Um, they didn't match up all the time, right? And that's a frustrating thing. And, you know, it's anywhere from 50, 50 to 65% percent of the case, you know, those don't necessarily match up. I'm kind of in the protein camp. I, you know, that's the final product. That's what I want to see. It's just really difficult to make you know, to get those antibodies. And so we had to make custom antibodies for the zona pellucida proteins in chicken that had to make sure it matched with turkeys so we could do turkeys as well. Uh, so that's why it takes a long time, right, to get some of these studies out because, you know, and with the birds, with that evolutionary divergence, it just, unfortunately, we can't just get online and, and find an antibody. Um, I have been lucky in a sense, so I'll take, you know, to the sperm approach, we do assays for sperm ability. I said, you know, we don't, we can do an accidence assay, right? We can tell high sperm, low sperm. I have a per call gradient where we can separate even within an individual high performing sperm and low performing sperm. And then you can assess like what proteins are different from them. Now it's not a good picture because all I can do is essentially take high and low, separate them on like a 2D, put them in this software, this PD Quest, and, you know, maybe get a hot spot with the high mobile versus the low mobile or the opposite, um, cut it out and send it for sequencing. And, you know, it all sounds like, oh, that's going to work out. And then when you get it back from sequencing, it's just this list of peptides that, and then you have to search, comb through the list and see what might make physiological sense that would be more highly expressed in one versus the other. Um, and I've looked out a couple of times and found some that make sense and then try to shortcut and see, all right, well, let's line up the mice, you know, the mouse or the rats, um, you know, sequence versus the predicted sequence for the chicken and see how much their overlap is. And if I get, you know, a polyclonal antibody and there's, you know, greater than 80% coverage or 70% coverage. I'm like, let's try it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so occasionally you'll look up and find something, but the protein game is a hard game uh, when it comes to working with chickens. But that's, that's my preference. That's kind of what my lab's set up for is just getting to the point where you can get that antibody. Once you get the antibody, you know, you're off and running. It's it's not yeah. that hard from that point forward. Uh, but getting to that point is 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 difficult. 
Gosh. So it sounds like you, uh, you're you using or developing molecular approaches that are kind of trying to solve these real world applied problems, which are basically resulting in different perhaps line, levels of fertility based on a line. So I yeah, I saw that call for proposals and I also thought it was um, really interesting. So I have to admit when I was in uh, undergrad, genetics class was <laughs> my least favorite. I was all into nutrition and immunology, but just from like a, a big picture perspective, do you think the selection for growth and productivity and livability has negatively selected for maybe some of these other reproductive parameters that you're able to so you're able to think about and find, you know, based on a line? I mean, I would say maybe, but I don't know enough about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I wouldn't know enough about it. I would doubt that there's a direct, like, as you're saying, it's more, I think, that it can be improved. I don't mm -hmm. know how much it's been knocked down. We do, I yeah. mean, we do have the time stamps, which would be interesting to study. So we have like the ACRBs and the ARBs, which are legacy, mm -hmm. you know, breeds that we can look at. And that's what I'm going to start to do is look at and see, has there been a change as a result yeah. of the selection that may feed into this? I think yeah. a lot of it just comes down to as we've selected for their efficient growth and their growth, that's just put more pressure and, 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 you know, these, you take a broiler to five pounds and, you know, five weeks. And now for that breeder, we're holding that girl off until she's 20 plus weeks. So, I mean, th those managerial things that broiler breeder farmers have to deal with are also kind of having a role with, with our fertility. But it would be interesting to see um, that if if there has been an inadvertent decrease in anything. Um, so that's something that that will be analyzed using those legacy breeds would just be kind of a good time step to see um, if that is the case or not. Yeah, the those old breeds, the heritage or legacy breeds seem to be really important for some of these problems that are arising now to know <laughs> if the selection has done this or if there's other competing factors. So they're very important <laughs> to maintain. Yeah, we're lucky to, we're, we are lucky to have those. We are very lucky. To yeah. Have so um, just kind of as a point of interest, it, are those birds that you house at UGA and you keep or do you have collaborators that supply you? We So we house both uh, an Athens random bread and a Athens Canadian random bread. So they're, 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 you know, kind of a time stamp. I think it's 1957 off the top of my head um, yeah. that allows you to look at what did a broiler look like in the late fifties versus today? And so maintaining that line always gives us that time yeah. stamp that we can go back to. Yeah, the I've seen the the paper in Poultry Science where they have the heritage and then today. So are those birds like the little petite one kilogram guys? Like visually, you obviously can probably tell a difference, right? Oh yeah, you can. I mean, that's in, um, <laughs> a lot of my intro courses. We'll we'll have a um, so some of our uh, colleagues at UGA have you know process the birds. And if you process some of those ACRBs, I mean, you literally have to zip tie them to the shackalons because oh. they won't, they won't fit. They're, right. they're petite. <laughs> so they are small. Yeah. They're uh, not getting a lot. That, I mean, that's incredible what genetics and nutrition and veterinary care have done to change and improve sustainability in the last 70 years is incredible. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the story to tell, right? Um, that's the story that I, that I like to tell. It's, it's amazing yeah. what has happened, what we've been able to accomplish. Yeah, I, I like looking at heritage photos for any breed. I mean, even to companion animals. It's so interesting what breeding has done and we've selected for in the last hundred years, you know, for livestock and companion. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, we maintain those. So and they're they're available. So if you're out there doing projects, our graduate students actually maintain and regenerate the line. So anytime you need them, that's so cool. Uh, the graduate students would be glad to yeah <laughs> to load them off. Yeah, we uh, we host some heritage lines up here as well. That Dr. Sue Lamont has been tasked with taking care of, um, and she's she does have some 
uh, broiler type lines. Um, but the, the overall thrust of her program is, uh, you know, immune markers and some other productivity markers. So she's got uh, eight different lines that are, are really interesting because they don't look anything like production birds. They're, uh, you know, birds that have heat tolerance or high or low immune response. So, yeah, but we don't, we don't have just a specific uh, random bred um, broiler line. So that would be, that would be really cool <laughs> to interact with. Um, so with your, with your work in uh, chickens and, and turkeys as well, um, what are some of your thoughts about maybe more of the management side of the birds? Like what can we, what are we doing right now that, that we could do better? I know you have kind of a interest in welfare as well. Yeah. So, and my welfare goes back to what, and particularly during the rearing phase of broiler breeders, right? So we, we, we have within them this genetic potential to grow. Um, and in order to, for their, you know, so they're essentially holding the genetics for this amazing growth potential, but realizing that potential would impair their ability to do their job, which is to reproduce. Um, and so we have to hold them back with, with in, in terms of feed restriction. Um, not always, but in general, you'll see welfare standards that happen in the EU come over, you know, to North America. Um, and so one in instance is, you know, in North America, we typically restrict them via skip a day feeding. Um, we, you know, feed, you know, a two day allotment of what they would have every other day. And what that does is that helps with uniformity. So the quote unquote shire birds, right, can, can have access to feed. Um, I like to, you know, see what we can do on our end to make management, both for the farmers and especially for those birds, a lot easier through that restrictive phase. I mean, one study I did was to try to hold, so to increase the growth curve so that you could photo stimulate them at 15 weeks. So bring them to the weight of 2.1 kilograms at 15 weeks versus the normal state of 2021 20, weeks. And so we did that. Um, the birds in the 15 weeks did come in to lay earlier. They did not peak as well as the 21 weeks, uh, but it did show that they had the potential, right, to come in production earlier. It just may, may now be an aspect of management. So the biological potential is there for early production, early good production that's not significantly different than the standard of what we do now. Um, so that's promising. I also played with um, everyday feeding and I did it spin feeding um, in the sense I wanted it, I think to a consumer, they would be interested in spin feeding in the sense that it seems more natural. Right, so it's not coming through a trough, it's thrown on the floor, they get to go out and scratch around and find their feed. And that worked well. It actually improved their uniformity to an extent, which is a good ideal measurement uh, uh, for a broiler breeder farmer. Interestingly, their stress levels were a little higher. Um, oh, and yeah. I'm not a behaviorist, <laughs> so I don't under I don't know why, but it could be that, you know, whenever we would go in there to measure their blood court, we would do it before they ate because so you could get a, oh. a baseline fasting court. And whenever they see us, we also are giving them feed on the floor, right? And so I'm just wondering, like, every time we walked in to draw their court, they're like, all right, where's our food? Where's our food? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, um, it, it, it was interesting that the everyday spin tended to have higher court levels, the everyday fed than that of the skip a day. Um, so, uh, but it, it's it's really interesting to play with the broiler breeder model. The, the only issue is it's very expensive, right? So you can run through oh, a broiler yeah. experiment and it's done, and you could do a three week trial, and that's that's fine, you know. Um, for a breeder, I mean, just rearing is going to be you know, 20 weeks. Um, and then to take it through production is looking at 65 weeks. 
that's a lot of feed, that's a lot of housing, a lot of cost. Uh, so it's a very expensive undertaking, but I, I think there needs to be more. And there's a lot of interesting work being done. Um, Martin Zudoff at, at the University of Alberta does an outstanding job uh, working with his precision feeding. And so there are a lot of researchers taking on with really interesting ideas to solve this issue, but I still think it's an underserved area area um, that has plenty of opportunity. Yeah, I I agree, and I think maybe part of that underserving is exactly what you said with cost, but oh, yeah. with the you know the inter well cost and time, but with the with the integrated uh, nature of the poultry industry, the you know the people that are really interested in this stuff, um, there's few of them compared to the producers, but all the producers care when fertility goes down, right? That's right. <laughs> so, that's right. And now it's happening. So the, so, yeah. 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 So what, so what do you think? Um, I've just been kind of following the the news, but what do you think about that, that change in fertility? I feel like it's been going on for a couple of years and it kind of hit this critical mass of we now have avian influenza and we've got reduced fertility. Like we really need to tackle this problem. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I... I don't know why it's it's come to an head it, all of a sudden when it's always been lurking in the background. Um, yeah. it, it's to the point where it's, it's even sometimes difficult to source birds, right? Because they're trying to use those birds as much as they're possible for production because unlike before, they don't have access. So they need to place as many as possible. And, you know, um, they're not placing as, as much as they could. Uh, which has not really been the case in a while. So it, it came to a head pretty quick, but it's always been lurking in the background. So I'm not sure what's all went into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you have you noticed certain strains or breeds have just had more changes as far as some of the analyses that you've done? I mean, is there a way to kind of pick the ones with bigger changes and then work backwards? Or would that kind of be a... It's a, it's such a global issue with all the strains that everyone sort of needs help. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to do. So you you have definitive lines. So you know the next experiments will obviously be with the ACRBs, the ARBs, and uh, the modern line. Well, then the modern line sometimes is kind of hard, right? Because that's proprietary, mm -hmm. and, and they don't necessarily yeah. want that, uh, you know, occurring, you know, uh, in open without their and they do it themselves, right? They have an idea of right. of, of what's happening, um, and but you do have interesting genetic lines. So my turkey lines were a, a great line that was developed uh, by Dr. Nestor long ago, where there was differential selection for egg production and growth. And with that, you got, behold, a difference in fertility, just selecting on two criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, there, would, there, there probably needs to be, I mean, we're, it's a money issue, just like it's hard to do a broiler breeder line, but to develop lines that will be able to answer a lot of these interesting questions that we have. Um, yeah. to, to my knowledge, there's not a whole lot out there aside from, you know, our cob and our avogens um, that, that we can work with. We, we have our legacy heritage breeds, um, but not a lot that there's been a, a directed uh, divergence of selection criteria to make comparisons, especially when it comes to fertility. Yeah. So um, just just a question that's kind of been like rolling around in my head. Um, so if a hen lays an egg, you can assume she's fertile, right? I mean, the egg was laid, so it's there for the opportunity <laughs> or she's got egg, eggs, you know. Um, so would you say the fertility issues, would you pinpoint male fertility as a bigger issue or just the rate of lay in females or is it combined? Because I know compared to, you know, the laying hens, broiler breeders are not laying at the same rate, right? They've already got a reduced rate of lay. So is there, are there additional problems with the egg that kind of contribute to some of these fertility issues or is it a combination of lowered rate of lay and maybe some male fertility issues? It's a combination of both, but it all actually comes back to, you know, their genetic selection. So you're dealing with laying hens who have been selected for the production of eggs. And so our broiler breeders, that was not their main criteria. And so it shows that, you know, somewhere within that genome, there is that capacity, right? 
that we have with the laying hands, but that's not just been their criteria of selection. And so it, um, you know, they'll, they'll peak, you know, sometimes as high as the eighties, but it, it falls off much quicker than you'll see, um, with your, with your laying hands. Um, so it, it's that in combination with just maintaining that, that body weight with that potential to, of growth. And so, um, if, they get too big, you'll get instances of, you know, double ovulations, you know, this extended hierarchy, which then can interfere with rate of lay. Um, and then also just with mating, the bigger they get, the harder it is for, for natural mating. Um, in terms of sperm production and sperm quality, that's an interesting question that you know, I don't know. You can get if you do an AI, you can get good fertility as long as he's staying in production throughout, you know, they're going to produce enough to get into those sperm storage tubules and be ready for lay. If you're doing it with AI, it's with the natural mating where it becomes uh, problematic. You still want that high mobility and that, you know, good sperm quality. Um, but it's really comes back to, you know, these birds are naturally mating and as they get older and we're taking them past, you know, 45, 50 to 60 weeks, it's, it's a little harder. Yeah. Do you think with, uh, I guess with hatchability and fertility issues that they're going to push the breeder flocks older and older, um, just to maybe maintain more census? <laughs> that's a good question. That would be a cost analysis. That's out of my yeah. field, right? Cause then you gotta, <laughs> yeah. the, how much feed are you giving up per egg? Right. And yeah. then to renew. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Those, uh, the cost analysis things are always really important, but that again, at the commercial level, isn't, isn't really info that a researcher is privy to. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and that's kind of you know, what, what I like about it. It's, it's a science with a business aspect, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it, you, you push the limit on both. Um, that's, that's what we do in poultry. Gosh. Yeah. That, yeah. The, the dollars are, are always, <laughs> always driving the rest of the equation for many different reasons. <laughs> um, so are, are there any other management practices that you've kind of been interested in as far as broiler breeders besides the skip a day? Like what else do you think is, uh, is interesting? Well, I had a graduate student. He was interested in a reproductive toxicology and we had some leftover roosters from that, you know, early photostimulation. Um, and he wanted to see the impact potentially that, you know, Roundup may have on aspects of male fertility because he had seen a paper where it had impaired uh, reproductive fitness in drakes, so male ducks. And so we set up a study where we used, that we, we um, enriched, right, feed, artificially enriched feed to levels that were within acceptable uh, tolerance levels um, for testing. But nevertheless, it was enriched, and we found that, yeah, in fact, Roundup did impair sperm mobility and impaired some histological observations. So it created, oh. um, what, what am I? Uh, it created um, vacuoles within the seminiferous oh. tubules, um, and then after recovery, mobility was improved, and those vacuoles were able to repair themselves over a period of four weeks. Um, mm. And interesting, we found that addition of humic acid, which you happened to pond in a liter literature review, you add that and it negates the effects of that enriched Roundup. So it's something interesting. I, I like to, yeah. to, to facilitate my students to find stuff. And sometimes they find stuff that's, that's interesting. Let's do that. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, you don't know what you're going to find until you try. And so that was a interesting. Now, do I think that's impairing our roosters? No, I don't think that's the case. I don't think the cost analysis the impact of going full organic would improve fertility. But it was something there that's a question that hasn't really been asked, and therefore we pursued it. And that's what science is about. Yeah, I I think probably the the most interesting thing about that is with a washout period, you reanalyzed and you saw a change. I mean that is telling that there was a direct impact from a, a change that was made in the feed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah, it was it was it was interesting. You know, I mean, it didn't affect fertility, luckily, and then, you know, it didn't impair sperm numbers, but it did have some parameters that are associated that we measure for sperm quality that were impacted. Yeah, gosh, that that's really cool. Um, something that I think is just so interesting um, that you've mentioned a few times is just the female and the sperm storage tubules because you know they have to engage in a race to head up to the <laughs> right you know yeah. the top of the tract right after that egg is laid and so i just i've always wondered is there is there a physical signal that happens maybe with the egg moving past like a stretch receptor or something that says start your race or are there other signals like i've not researched it deep enough, but maybe you have an answer because it's just so interesting to me. <laughs> um, I don't know that that's definitively known. So there is there is the, uh, and it's probably the earliest um, hypothesis was uh, mechanical receptors. As the egg mm. passes, it triggers the release from the uterovaginal junction where most of the sperm storage tubules are located. Um, there's more evidence to suggest that progesterone and there's even recent evidence that just oh. progesterone's involved with it and there's kind of a correlation so the the level of, there's a level of progesterone that stimulates the secretion of the cuticle which may coincide with the amount that triggers the release of sperm from the sperm storage tubules which would give them a good you know few hours to transverse the oviduct to be present at the time of fertilization so within that yeah. window yeah. Um, so all, most indications are likely as progesterone. And they've actually seen that upon exposure to progesterone, you get contraction of those um, sperm storage tubules and exposures mm -hmm. of the tails out, indicating that they're kind of being pushed out in order oh. to be present for fertilization. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's one of those things that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not very well defined. Yeah. The whole system is so interesting to me because you have an animal that's normally 106 degrees Fahrenheit and the sperm are cool with that. <laughs> so for, for a couple of weeks even. <laughs> yeah. And they're, um, you know, they're no nonsense, right? In terms yeah. of accessory glands, you just have the testes and throw them in the vas deferens and they're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Simple but complex. They have routed around something that other mammals have issues with. So, <laughs> well, it, you know, I came, so I, I did a postdoc at Emory, um, and it was studying sperm surface receptors and how they interact with zonal pellucid proteins. So, I kind of switched over to the sperm side, like what are the proteins that are involved in binding the zonal pellucid? And I, I guess I got a little spoiled because you have this nice round head. Um, oh, you know, the, the mammalian sperm, whereas, you know, the avian sperm is that vermiform where it is really tough to, if you want to do immunofluorescence, it's, it's not the easiest to do immunohistochemistry with, with you know, to, to look at different proteins that are localized at the acrosome region. Gosh, picked a, you picked a tough field with the uh, yeah, antibodies. Well, and... so you didn't know, right? But there's, but, it, you know. Uh, there, there's plenty of unanswered questions. That's kind of everywhere, but you know, it's uh, when you, you don't know until you get into the field, right? And then it just becomes this, it's a never ending series of questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I know um, our, our group works on this just a little bit from another, uh, like another angle, but people are not really freezing or manipulating rooster semen, right? I mean, it's all live cover. There's, they don't, really survived the freeze. Do you think that has to do with the shape or some other qualities? Maybe it likes to live at 106, so the freeze is just too cold? <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's, it's, you had, you, there's been work on that. I have never worked in that area, but mm -hmm. there's constantly work on that just because, especially in the turkey industry, how that would make it a lot easier if you could prolong storage of those sperm you know, for uh, transport off site or to bank them and hold on to them. Um, and then, and of course, also, we were just talking about the lack of lines. And over time, we've lost lines just because of the expense of maintaining them. And so being able to really store sperm, store gametes to regenerate lines as needed would, would be amazing. 
Um, but I know there's a lot of, you know, Julie Long at uh, the USDA kind of has, works in that area. So there are researchers who are in that area. Um, I wish I knew more. And I know, again, it's one of those needs that uh, would be great to find out just to be able to bank those, to hold on to, to all the potential genetic lines that we could use in our studies. Oh, yeah. It, it's such an interesting problem. Um... We're looking at sperm for some metabolic questions just because they're, you know, mostly an identical-ish population compared to immune cells, but we kind of got into the interesting question about freezing and are there metabolic changes that don't allow them to be frozen and that sort of thing, but we're kind of baby experts in that area, so <laughs> I don't know enough. I know enough to be dangerous to... <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. That's me in all areas, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, just enough, but not not meeting all the things you really need. But, I mean, we've found out some interesting things just because we know just enough, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, are uh, are there any any other, like, burning topics you wanted not to really. hit on? I mean, I'll say <laughs> we, we, we've tried working with um, – some professors in genetics who've been successful at using CRISPR and unfertilized oocytes to generate um, albinos. We're trying to use that same protocol, which the anole, like the chicken, has these large follicles, which makes them fairly easy targets. The potential problem with R, in the case of the chicken, which, get that confused sometimes. Um, the chicken's uh, follicles is they're so large that the amount of CRISPR that has to be used. So we're kind of playing with that. Uh, but that would be really neat because that that would really open up a lot of, you know, research areas in terms of knockout studies um, that would just be a boom for a lot of different fields. Yeah, gosh. Yeah, it's such an interesting area um but the logistics i think <laughs> it's tough have to it's, figure it's, them out it's, it's like everything it's like when i talk about you know some of the protein aspects the pathway set but it's running that path that's really difficult yeah the challenges that come with it so everything's yeah. easier said harder done oh that that's uh Exact, you're exactly right. I always, when someone talks to me and they say they want to do X, Y, Z, I immediately think about the how are you going to do this, right? So the how is the, the interesting. Um, it, but I mean, that's how people get degrees, right? My, my PhD right. students are figuring out the how for a lot of things, and they're really being great and creative at solving. <laughs> they do. They bring energy to the table. Yeah. And enthusiasm. Yes. That's what we need, enthusiasm. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have any closing thoughts about like where our industry is going as far as training students and, um, you know, the excitement around getting students to discover the poultry industry? Yeah, it's, we really, I mean, it's, it's something that's, I mean, it's always been there and, you know, well, it's, it's kind of like how we've been talking about fertility. The issues with fertility have always been there. Uh, but now we're coming to a point where it's, it's coming a little bit critical, right? We've, 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 you know, sunk down to like six poultry science departments and there's poultry taught everywhere. But in terms of poultry science departments, there's only six left. Um, and even then, sometimes it's hard getting students into there. So at the University of Georgia, as I mentioned before, most of our students are from suburban Atlanta. They have no idea about poultry production typically don't have any interest in take our courses just because it's animal based and they know they're going to get some hands-on experience that will set them up for veterinary school. Uh, and so getting out there and recruiting, because we need the best minds, because this is like the poultry industry is, we, we need brain power, right? It's balancing that science, that living organism, along with the business aspects and welfare and management we need big thinkers. We need big ideas to keep moving the industry forward. Um, we've done a great job. Um, I, I just think it's imperative that we always keep our mind on recruiting and rebuilding a new generation to continue powering us forward because there are no shortage of challenges facing us in the future. And in order to address those challenges, we need the best and the brightest. And, and to get them into our classrooms, get them into our programs, is imperative to the future of the industry. 
Yeah, I I agree with you there. <laughs> but you um, gotta hook them. That's it. Just gotta get them in there. Yeah. It's really about. I mean, it's me. I was like going to freaking Yellowstone, and then I. Just, you just got to tell me a little bit about the science that goes into chicken. Introduce me to that chicken. I, and it opens up a new world that you had no idea existed. I mean, I grew up in, I don't know if you know, Gainesville, Georgia, it's the proclaimed poultry capital of the world. Um, I didn't have any chicken experience. None. I knew almost nothing aside from seeing a chicken truck every once in a while and passing a, a broiler house. Um, that, you know, that class really opened my eyes into everything that goes into uh, what I was seeing on the roadside. Um, so it's getting them in the classroom and recruiting that next generation is is very important. And I, I hope we can continue to do that. And we're making our best effort at UGA. And I know, you know, in your department and the other poultry science departments, that is a I mean, there, there's research, there's teaching, extension, and really I would put recruitment as, as one of the driving uh, forces that we're, 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 or one of our, one of, one, what we're really looking to make an impact with the industry with. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You gotta snag them when we can. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so to, to close this today, I'd like to ask you the three questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, so the first one is, is what is your favorite poultry related book or resource? So probably, uh, Sturkey's avian physiology. It's, it's my reference. So it's, uh, it's on my desk at all times. Like I, you know, I have a little bookshelf, but that one always, I have this L shaped desk. It sits right beside me. And so. Whenever I'm reviewing papers or I need to put something in context or I'm writing a lecture, um, that book is opened up. Um, so it, that's my number one chicken book. Yeah, I, I love physical books. I am all about the physical book too. on and the yeah. table. Yeah. And reference books. Another good one is it's a little dated, but it's uh, commercial uh, chicken meat and egg production. And it's a two volume series. It's huge. It's probably going on. 25 to 30 years, but it's um, comprehensive. Like every sector is very well covered. Now there's been advances, but you still get a, a really general overlook, a comprehensive overlook of every, all the sectors that go into poultry production. That's awesome. Maybe we need to uh, get a little update for it for the like, right, 2000s. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's needed, yeah. Uh, just like the NRC, right? <laughs> that's right. That's been a, that's that's been wanted since, you know, I, I think I was in graduate school, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? Before I came to UGA, I taught at a liberal arts college, Georgia Gwinnett College, and um, we had a non-majors course and so we had a lot of like a leeway freedom. It was, it was like a biology non-majors course. And so I took um, this book, this, it's by Richard Dawkins, it's called The Greatest Show on Earth. And so it's an evolutionary biology book and it's about stories concerning evolution. And I built the course around that and a little bit of it was because I heard he may be coming to campus. Um, and so I built the course and, you know, I told the guy who was inviting him, yeah, I built this course. He said, you know, I might have uh, Richard Dawkins see if he can, you know, fit you in the schedule. And so I remember walking to the classroom and there was, you know, Richard Dawkins, preeminent biologist, sitting on a bench outside my classroom and stuff. and went, Dr. Benson. I was like, what the? <laughs> this is amazing. Wow. <laughs> Hello, Professor Dawkins. So, yes, yeah, so, yeah, he came in and, you know, um, I talked with my students and. It was that was that was a real highlight. So I've always been a fan of his books and his ability to tell the story, the selfish gene, putting evolutionary biology into a different kind of context that's really easier for me to understand as a molecular biologist. Um, and so he's usually one of my favorite art, art authors who write about biology. Gosh, that's a phenomenal experience. Uh <laughs> yes, yeah, that's one of the highlights. I mean, you know, there's yeah. the guy I listen to all the time just. Sitting, sitting there. You know, sitting there. Oh, God. <laughs> Love that. 
Oh gosh. Um, so the the third and last question is: In your opinion, what sets successful poultry professionals apart from those that are not? It's a couple of things. Um, so poultry professionals who work out into the industry, you do. It's a people. It's a people's business, right? And so it's about you know forming a network. Um, uh, it's about you know, being gracious, uh, personable, um, and just authentic at all times. Um, that along with just, I think if you're going to get into poultry, you're going to have a natural enthusiasm about what it's the bottom line, which is producing a very efficient protein product for mankind. Right. So if you if you take that outlook, saying that you are doing a service for the world, um, then I think you can go to your job every day with a sense of enthusiasm and drive. Um, and, and that's really what can build you up in the industry is to have that as your driving factor, that you are impacting you know, humanity in a positive way with our position. Yeah, that, that that's uh, amazing and office awful. <laughs> pertinent advice. Like it's extremely pertinent. Like I can't think of a better way to put that. So <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really, really great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to these podcasts now that I'm, you know. Absolutely. There, there's been a lot of really fun people on and I always learn from the, the ones that come on. So thank you again. <laughs> okay, good.